Welcome back to the ICL team server, which is very much still in bits sitting here on my bench. Last time in part one, we did get the machine to start up, as you can see, but there is a problem with it. Every time we try to boot, well, it only gets so far and then it crashes. As you can see, this time it has managed to throw some garbage onto the screen. It is quite random. Sometimes it will come up saying starting MS-DOS. Other times the screen will just be blank. And then occasionally, as you see here, it throws up some garbage. To be truthful, it reminds me of a memory fault. Now, one of the best things about this whole retro community is that, well, it's exactly that. It is a fantastic community of people all trying to help each other with their projects. And my project sitting on the bench here, well, it is very much no exception to that rule. I have had any amount of offers of help and I am very grateful for everyone for every suggestion of things to try. I've since learnt that this EISA motherboard, well, it needs to be properly configured from a utility that we need to run from DOS. We do, of course, need to get this thing to boot to DOS first. And so for that, the guys over on Vogons, where I created a thread to talk about this machine, those guys have came up with a few suggestions of things to try to get this to boot. This CPU card, and in particular, the cache, or more so the jumper settings associated with it. Now, last time we took a look at the datasheet for the ICL motherboard and the ICL CPU card. And looking at its stated jumper settings for the 256K of cache that's on here, well, that suggested that we had several jumpers missing. Fitting them, of course, did very little. It didn't change the fact that the machine won't boot. But on closer inspection, there is a table here. And for 256K, these jumpers were actually set correctly. That ICL datasheet is incorrect. But that does lead nicely into another point. Because over on Vogons, a user by the name of PC Hoarder Patrol well, he pointed to this page on the retroweb.com and as you can see by image one there on the left hand side, that is certainly that motherboard. This is an Acer J3 and in fact if we look up there, there is a custom chip with Acer written on it. Now if we take a look in the download section, there is a jumper manual for the Acer board and if we scroll down to the relevant section for the Acer CPU card, the table there at the bottom of the page for the cache jumper configuration, it matches this table printed onto the silk screen here on this card. So while this all is branded ICL, or well, the case is certainly branded ICL, as was the VGA card and the SCSI card, this is actually an Acer machine. And if we go back to the retro web page, we can see here as well that there is an Acer BIOS available version 2.4. Our BIOS is version 1.15. So why don't we try updating the BIOS to that newer Acer version rather than this old ICL version. So let's take this out of here and stick it into the TL866. In fact, we need to figure out what that chip is first, don't we? I don't really want to damage this label, so if I get the knife, hopefully we can just pick up the corner of it. Slowly just work that in there underneath. And our chip is an AMD AMP010-150PC. Just that top line we're worried about, AM28P010. In the XG Pro software then, let's see if we can find that chip. No. Let's just search for AM28, all the AMD chips. There's an F010, 
Ours was a P, but let's just try that. Then let's try to read it out. This will check the ID of the chip as well. So if this is not compatible, it will give us an error message. Yeah, that seems to have read that fine. There is our BIOS. So before we do anything else, let's just save that, will we? And we'll save it in there and call it ICL BIOS 1.15. We can of course erase that chip, device erase, that should be it, let's just try to read it out, yep it is now blank. So let's load that other BIOS, this is it here, the one I downloaded from that website, version 2.4. Full of zeros. Lots of zeros. What's oh that's all the BIOS data there. Right, let's just write it and try it. Let's do a quick verify. Yep, that's all good. So let's see what this does. Power on. Well, we're getting a video signal. Yeah. Seems to be working. EISA 46DX2 BIOS version 1.2 R 2.4. That'd be release 2.4, revision 2.4. I thought it was version 2.4. Well, look, regardless, it's still a later version than our original 1.15. So it's counted up 16 meg of memory good, 384k of shadow, and 256k of cache. To enter setup, press Control Alt Escape. It has detected our floppy drive. It says we've got one parallel port. I don't have a parallel port connected. I suppose it's just sensing the device. NV checksum error. Internal cache off. External cache off. That's weird. Run BIOS disabled. Video run BIOS. Please run the EISA configuration utility at the DOS prompt. F1 to continue. Well, that is something that we will have to do eventually. We will have to run that EISA configuration utility to configure the board properly. But let's have a look in setup first. And this is quite a bit different from what we've seen previously with the ICL BIOS. So basic system configuration. And yeah, all the information is there. One thing that I've actually found a bit odd the Dallas real-time clock originally was not holding its settings, but, you know, we are a few days later. This has been off and on a few times, but it is now remembering the date and time. I didn't think a Dallas chip was rechargeable, so I'm not really sure why it suddenly started working, but there we are anyway. So date, time... Floppy disk drive 1.44 meg, that's correct, we don't have a B. We don't have any IDE fixed disks installed at the minute, so we'll leave them on none. There's all our memory information at the bottom, as we've seen before. Advanced system configuration. This gives us a lot more to play with. So all the shutter RAM options, let's just leave all that disabled. But the internal CPU cache is disabled and the system cache is disabled. Why? Let's enable those. I'm not sure if it's write buffer or write back. Let's just leave it on write buffer and the burst read wait state. We'll just put it to the slowest. 3222. Two, two. System security. Anything else to see in there? Not really. Nothing that we'll be really interested in anyway. Let's see what it does now that we've enabled the cache. So counting its uh, system memory. Cache memory error. Could this be the cause of all the problems? Because what we were seeing previously, I did think it looked like a memory problem. And now that I've enabled the cache, it's giving an error. Do we have a bad cache chip? And that's interesting. It has turned off the external cache again by itself. 
Would that further suggest that there is a cache problem and it's in one of the external chips? Let's go back into here. Let's just disable the external cache. We'll leave the internal CPU cache on and let's see if it gives that error again. Still throws the cache memory error. I wonder is it still trying to test the cache RAM on the CPU card even though I have disabled it within the BIOS. I have just a very basic MS-DOS install on this, just command.com on this. Let's see if it'll boot. I just moved you back to get a better look of everything. Press F1 to continue. Reading the drive. I thought I had this disk set up. In fact, I was pretty sure I had that set up right. Yeah, it's reading something. Come on. Starting MS-DOS. It's booted. It has booted. Is that the issue? Do we have a cache RAM chip failure? Is that all it is? At least we know in principle that the machine works, you know, the board is working. We just needed that other BIOS so that I could disable the cache RAM. Right, here's an idea. 256K of cache on the CPU card. That's those eight chips there. The ninth one, that'll be the tag RAM. But we can't set this to just use a single bank. So bank zero, which I assume would be that bank there. And we can't configure it. We can't configure the jumpers here to just 128K of cash. So let's try that and see if the problem disappears. If it does, then you would assume that the fault faulty chip is maybe in bank one. Assuming of course that that is bank zero and that is bank one. But let's just try this. So to change it to a single bank, these two jumper positions need moved. Jumper 12 needs taken off as does 20. And you know what, just to be sure, I'm gonna remove those four chips. Let's see what this does. The cache is of course disabled at the minute. We'll need to go into the BIOS to re-enable it. Cache memory error. Maybe we do still have a problem there, but I just want to enable this. Yeah, okay, cache memory error. Just let me see something here quickly. If I disable both of these, if you remember the first time I booted, they were disabled and it actually told us the amount of cash installed. Let's just see if it does come up 128K. Yeah, okay, so it is coming up, the 128. Although I'm not sure if it's getting that just from the jumper settings or if it is reading that from the chips that are on there. But look, regardless, we do have a cache memory error still. So next thing to try then is to take those four chips out and swap it for those. Still getting a memory error. I put a couple of utilities on that disk. Check CPU, that should tell us the CPU type, but also tell us if the CPU's cache is enabled. Um, what? 46DX2 Intel, yeah. Internal CPU speed 50, bus clock speed 25. When we had the ICL BIOS in this board, it told us we had a DX266. Why is it only running at 25 megahertz? Unfortunately, that heatsink is far too well glued on there. The only way I think you could get that off is to try and twist it off, but you risk uh, damaging the chip. Could I maybe get that chip out of the socket though? If I take my time with this, will it come up? Because there might be something written underneath it so that we can identify exactly what it is. We do have a part number here. Let me try and Google that.
Well, this is interesting. CPU clock mismatch setup setting. So is the BIOS here reading the ID of the chip? It knows it's a 66 megahertz chip, but it's only run at 50 megahertz. Something has to be set wrong. Or is there possibly a jumper setting wrong somewhere on the board? And it's that which is getting picked up. Is there a mismatch? Is there a confliction somewhere between a setting for 25 and 30 megahertz? So I'm just going to go over the board here quickly. I'm going to pull out the jumper settings for this and just double check that everything is set correctly for DX266 and obviously 33 megahertz front side bus. Fixed it. Bus clock speed is now 33 megahertz, internal CPU speed 67, yeah, DX266. It's now working at the correct speed. And you know what it was? Jumper here in position JP2. That is a new jumper I put on there. There is the old one. The old one was really loose, not making good contact. So that was essentially open. Both of those were open. And with both of those open, CPU speed. Our front side bus speed is set to 25 megahertz. New jumper on JP2. One is open, two is closed, 33 megahertz. The chip is now running at its correct speed. But that makes me wonder, what about all the rest of these jumpers? Some of those ones there are quite loose as well. And it's these ones that configure the cache. So I do have a big bag of new ones. I just want to replace all those. You never know. Yeah, I suppose it was a long shot. We're still getting a cache memory error. But at least we have now solved the problem with the CPU speed. Still doesn't explain why our cache doesn't work though. Well, I am running out of ideas. I have tried every combination of these cache ROM chips. Tried adjusting the size of the cache ROM installed, but no this will not work. I even tried an alternative single bank of cache RAM chips. It doesn't work. Even tried another CPU just on the off chance there was something funny going on. Doesn't behave any differently. One thing I'm not sure of is this chip here. This is a P4C187 and from what I can tell that is a 64k by one byte RAM chip. But what purpose could that serve on this board? You would assume it is related to the cache, but what is it doing? If you remove that chip and try to power up the machine, it still just throws cache RAM error, but possibly another failure point, and I don't have a replacement to test with. There are two latches here, 74F573s. Checked around those with the Logic Probe and they look fine. There is this custom chip here, labelled J3 CPU U16, but I suppose there's not much point in worrying about that. If there's a failure in there, well, there's nothing we can really do about it anyway. So I'm definitely out of ideas when it comes to the cache. I even checked all the voltage rails and everything coming to here, everything's fine. Checked all these resistor packs and all as well, just in case there was something shorted, you know, or our data line or address line being pulled low, but no. All that seems fine. So let's put that to the side for now. The other thing that you'll notice though is that we now have a compact flash adapter here with one gig CF card and on this I have installed MS-DOS 6.22 and we've also stuck the EISA configuration utility that we need to try and set up the rest of this board. I can't help but wonder if there'll be something within that utility that is related to the memory or the cache. Maybe there's something in there that I'm just missing here. And there is no hardware failure. But if we're going to be doing that, well, I think it's only right that we go ahead and install the SCSI card and the network card. The SCSI card in particular being EISA. I think we need the setup utility in order to configure this. So it is within the EISA CFU folder. And I think it is SD. 
There's the executable that we want. So we don't need to copy a configuration file across because all the configuration files are already on the hard drive. The EISA configuration non-volatile memory for the system is invalid. A backup system configuration information file however does exist. To use this backup SCI file to restore your configuration press enter to select OK. If you prefer to reconfigure your system press escape. Let's reconfigure the system. So we need to select the appropriate configuration file, the appropriate EISA configuration file. And I'm sure you're probably wondering why do these all say Acer if the system that all this came out of is an ICL. Well, remember earlier when we loaded up that new BIOS, that new Acer BIOS? Well, this machine now thinks it is an Acer as such, so we have to use the appropriate Acer EISA configuration file. Now, all that said, I don't actually see one here that is compatible because this board is an Acer J3, as we've seen from the RetroWeb website earlier. So we try this one, Acer J1. System board ID mismatch. The hardware board ID does not match the ID stored in non-volatile memory. The hardware ID will be used. All right, okay. So I must have picked the wrong one. The hardware ID of the board is saying it's an Acer Altos 800, 7000, 9000. And there is our SCSI adapter. Is that saying it's in slot two? I have the SCSI adapter in slot three. One, two, three. Oh no, hold on a minute. System, slot one, slot two, slot three. So that's okay. It hasn't detected the VGA or the network card though. Is that because those are just ISA only, not EISA? This is an EISA configuration tool after all. We can't try to add another card if we press insert. There's a VGA board. Let's see what happens if we try to insert that. Okay, VGA LCD board, slot one. did add that in there, we can remove it again. Do we need to do that? Honestly, I am not really sure. So if anyone watching this can provide some more information for me, please let me know. There is a CPU board there and there's more CPU boards here. Do we need to add a CPU board? Would it be that one? 4633, we are running at a 33 megahertz bus. That doesn't seem to match the description of our CPU card, but let's just hit OK, see what it does. There are no available slots to place the following board. Let's just leave it like this, will we? Should we take a quick look in the advanced method? We can get further information out of the system here. Base memory 640k. Extended memory? Four megabytes extended with the 16 mega RAM on here total. Uh, let's just leave it like this. It's detected all this itself. And if we scroll on down, then we get some information about the SCSI card. Right, well, if it's not blatantly obvious already, I'm not 100% sure what we are looking at here. This is my first time delving into EISA, so any help that anyone could give would be much appreciated. But let's just exit, save everything. That is the SCSI device. And okay, it is booting to the IDE drive again. But how about we add the SCSI hard drive? Okay, I have the working Seagate Hawk drive connected up here. That's the one gig drive. Or well, just slightly over one gig. There were another two drives in the system. There's one of them there. Although when we tested this last time, it wouldn't spin. This one spun up straight away. This one wouldn't. In fact, the other two wouldn't. They're both the same. Now thinking it was perhaps a little bit of stiction, I did give them a little tap 
off the desk. Okay, I whacked it off the desk, but no, that didn't make any difference, so I declared these dead. I did get a little bit of flack for that in the comments of the last video, and that's fair enough, because I didn't realize that these drives could be set via jumpers to wait for a start command. They can even be set for a delayed start, so to put less stress on a PSU. But checking the datasheet for these drives, Seagate Hawk ST31200N, well, it is this jumper block here that would determine the settings for the drive starting up. The two jumpers that are fitted there, those are just to do with the termination of the drive, that is the factory default positions. It would be the jumpers over to this end of the block that you would need to set if you wanted to force this drive to wait for a start command or have a delayed startup. Those jumpers are not set, that is again the default position and like that this drive should spin up as soon as power is applied. It doesn't, I think this drive and the other one which is set identically, I think both of them are faulty. But we do know that this one does spin up, so let's see what it does. Okay, this is the SCSI detection. And there it is, drive D. Can we access the drive D? Nope. What about if we run F disk? So change the current fixed drive. That is there, drive 2. And let's display the partition information. And yeah, there we are. I was sort of expecting to see this. Type non DOS. Another thing that came out of the last video, more positive comments, was that a lot of people who have used the ICL team server in the past, they were used as Unix systems. I'll be honest and say that Unix would be a complete mystery to me, but the fact that it does say type non DOS here, well, that maybe confirms that our ICL team server was indeed running Unix itself. So it is of little use to me, to be honest. Yes, it would be nice to be able to browse the contents of the original drive to try and get some idea of what this machine was used for. But unfortunately, I don't have the means to interrogate a Unix drive partition, if indeed that actually is Unix, I'm just making an assumption here. And so we will never know. Although. Let's try and set up the SCSI drive for DOS. So let's just delete that partition. And then we will create a partition on it. And there it is, new DOS partition on the SCSI drive. So we'll reset the system and then we can format that. And then we'll just install MS-DOS onto it. Okay, all done. Let's remove the disk and see if it'll boot. It's giving a fixed disk error, that's because I removed the IDE drive, let me get rid of that. And hopefully now it just boots straight into DOS. Booting off the SCSI drive, fantastic. That's done. One of the other problems then that we still need to solve, this door. Why will this not stay closed? As you can see it just falls open. Can we fix it though? Well I've disassembled everything and it seems the issue is twofold. The door has this wire running down it, which as you can see is in Rather poor state of repair. It looks like it's been twisted up and been stretched. So ideally that would have to be replaced because the wire runs down over the top of this pulley here, but because of the state of it, it keeps jumping off. It is then this little ram here that keeps tension on the whole thing. And this I think is just done. I mean, it still works, but as you can maybe see there, it has good tension until it gets to about there, and then it's a bit limp for the rest of it. And it's that section there, it just doesn't have enough energy left in it 
to keep the door up. So I'd need to get a new bit of wire, but more importantly, I'd need a new one of these. And I don't even have the first clue where to start looking for something like that. Presumably this has 90 newtons of pressure in it. There's a manufacture date there, 5th 94, but I don't see any other product information on it. So if someone could point me in the direction of where to get something like this, please let me know. So as the door comes up, you can see this thing only takes so much of the tension. But it's hanging loose now, that should be away down there. And because of the ripple that's in the cable, you can see there it has already jumped off the pulley. That's it back on again. But as soon as the door goes down and tries to come back up, there's it off again. Yeah, combination of new bit of wire required and a new piston. Well, I think that's pretty much everything we can do today. We have now one mostly working ICL team server, even if now it thinks it's an Acer. There are still two issues to resolve though, the door and that CPU card. For the door, I was thinking what I might do is just strip out the mechanism that is in here and instead just fit a magnet to the top of it. This bit up here is metal and so a strong enough magnet I think could possibly just hold that in place. The CPU card though and the cache on it, well that's a whole other story because I'm still not really sure why it's not working. Do you remember back to the start of the video when I was talking about differences in jumper settings between the ICL datasheet and the Acer datasheet for that CPU card? Well, if I bring up a picture of both CPU cards out of those two manuals, the ICL one is on the left, the Acer one on the right. Well, on the ICL card, you can see it does show nine cast chips, labeling eight of them as bank zero and bank one, and the ninth as the tigram. That is sort of the standard setup that I would expect to find. On the Acer card though, well, it shows more accurate looking sockets for the actual cache positions, like those that we do have on the CPU card. Although it shows a bank of five, then three, but it also shows two other socket positions and labels one of them tag RAM. And so after a conversation with a few guys online, what we're thinking is that, do you remember that other chip? That 64K by one byte chip that I didn't really know what it was doing. What we're thinking is, could that possibly be the tag RAM for this CPU card? And could that be faulty? Now, I don't have a replacement for it. I have ordered one, but it needs to come all the way from China via AliExpress. So it is gonna be a while until it gets here. If that is indeed the tag RAM for the CPU card, then what's the point of the ninth cache chip that looks the same as all the rest, what is it doing then? One theory, could that be for parity? I honestly don't know. Would a server like this require parity in its cache as well as in its system RAM? I'm not sure, but if you know, maybe let me know. So as I say, I have ordered up that other chip and I've also ordered a complete set of new cache I need another set anyway for another upcoming project, so just order them now. And then next time when we take a look at this machine, we'll just try swapping all of that out. To be honest with you, I think it can only really be a fault with one of those chips. Everything else seems to work fine. You know, the machine is working grand. So I don't think there is another failure on that CPU card as such. If there was, I don't think it would work. I suppose the other thing that this system needs is a sound card, so I'll try and pick up something for that. And I could probably use a bit more system RAM as well, couldn't it? There's only 16 meg in there. I'd like to put at least 32 in it, maybe 64. And then I suppose the other thing I need to decide actually is what am I going to do with a 30 year old ICL team server? 
I do have a pretty good 46 DX2 setup already. So what can I do with this? I think it would be cool to turn it back into a server of some shape, form or another. I could always stick it online and give everybody access to it, but I'm sure knowing the internet it would very quickly be hacked and all the computers on my network would be destroyed. So that's maybe not the best idea, but if anyone can think of something that I could do with this, please let me know. But that's it for now. Unfortunately we weren't able to get it totally fixed and working in this video, although the vast majority of it is there. Next time though, we will try and get it finished off. Will be a while though, because I'm waiting on parts coming from the other side of the world. But that's it for now. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Why not hit subscribe if you haven't done so already. Still plenty more yet to come here on CRG. And I'll see you next time.